you for joining Jennifer Shops and Associates in our 2019 webinar Wednesday series. We are coming to you live from downtown Washington, D.C. Our webinars are every Wednesday, and you can find the upcoming schedule on our website. Past webinars and all recordings are also on our website and on our YouTube channel, along with over 160 other recordings on federal contracting topics. All are complimentary. If you have questions for our speakers today, you can email them directly with the contact information you'll see on the last slide. And this is just a little bit about us. We are a Washington, D.C.-based firm and provide services for federal contractors. This ranges from market analysis reports to proposal writing and also post-award compliance. More information is on our website, so please visit us there. We do offer advertising, so you can contact me if you would like more information on that. And we have two speakers with us today, Amber and Lisa, and they're going to be covering GovCon cold calling, five ways to warm up your approach. Uh, thank you guys for joining us, and I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you very much, and welcome, everybody. We are going to talk about a topic that some people definitely turn their nose up at, and it's this concept of cold calling and government contracting. And we're here to tell you that cold calling is not dead. However, there are ways that you can warm up your approach so that you're not playing the same old schmaltzy sales guy, you're not doing the calls out of the blue at random hours to people that you don't know, you're not acting like the calls that you get out of Clearwater, Florida, we all get them. So we're going to walk you through some five different ways to warm up your approach. Next slide. So we're going to talk about how to call with a purpose, how to introduce yourself at an event, starting an online dialogue, submitting RFIs and market research, and lastly, just how to make it easy. Next slide. Calling with a purpose. So the way we're going to present this webinar is going to be a list of do's and don'ts when it comes to cold calling. So when it comes to cold calling and calling with a purpose, here are some things that you don't want to do. You don't just want to call a contracting professional, program manager, octobu rep out of the blue with nothing to say except for hi. Some people call without a plan of what they're actually going to discuss once they get there, and that is a huge mistake. Another mistake is calling a federal representative to ask about what the upcoming opportunities are going to be in their agency, in their office. That's another huge mistake. You shouldn't be calling, especially cold calling, for intel. You should be cold calling to sell. All of the intel up until that point should have been done before. You also shouldn't call and not leave them a voicemail. I know a lot of us are, you know, especially younger generations don't love the voicemail. I know I've left Amber a couple of voicemails in the past and she thought it was an emergency. That's not how the government views voicemail. So always make sure that you leave that level of following up that saying, hey, this is who I am, this is why I called, and this is why I'm going to call back. So I mentioned before that if you call somebody, a customer, a potential customer, you have to have done your homework. You need to know if the person that you're talking to has purchasing power, because it's going to change the way that you talk to them and the way that you sell to them. If they do have purchasing power, you need to know what they've bought historically. It, you know, there's no better indicator on what someone's going to spend money on than what they have spent money on. So look at their buying histories, the trends for them specifically. You need to know their missions, obviously those needs, wants, and biases that we had mentioned in the previous webinar. And you should come to this call already knowing what their upcoming opportunities are going to be. And there's a lot of different tactics that we could talk to on how to figure those out. But unfortunately, we don't necessarily have the time to get into the nitty gritty there. When you call them, you need to have your relevant elevator pitch memorized and ready. Your capabilities need to match their mission. If you know that historically they've spent money on shredding paper, and you come to them with your elevator pitch saying that you know how to make a hot air balloon, that's all well and good, but the two aren't copacetic. So make sure that you are being relevant to the types of things that they are buying when it comes to your capabilities, your value proposition, and your differentiators. And of course, listen more than you talk. It should be a quick pitch. It should be very succinct. 
you shouldn't be talking their ear off, you know, just not taking a breath so they don't have an opportunity to hang up on you. Make sure that you're asking the right questions, be inquisitive, and again, actually pay attention, write down what they say, and then follow up on that. Amber, anything to add? No, and we'll cover, you know, we'll kind of dive a little bit deeper into these as we go on, but the biggest thing is being persistent um, and following up and doing what you say you're going to do. If you leave a voicemail saying, I will call you back in a week, you call back in a week. If you say, I will email you as a follow-up, you email as a follow-up, and you have to stay persistent because they notice that. So if you say something and you don't do it, I promise you, they will they will note that and they will take notes on you as well. So make sure you always follow up. All right, next slide. Okay, so we're gonna talk about how to introduce yourself at an event. And this is more, and this is, you know, not Miss Manners here, this is, this is not anything like that, but this is really how you introduce yourself at an event. Maybe if you've called them a few times, they haven't answered. If you've emailed them a few times and they haven't responded, you still have to kind of approach them with tact and grace and not just, you know, walk up to them and say, how come you haven't responded to me? Because they will not know who you are. So starting with the don't, the number one thing is don't overstay your welcome at their table or booth. We've all seen this happen. We may have all been one that has done it before. But do not overstay your welcome. They also notice those things as well. Something that we don't talk about enough um, and that we, we put kind of contracting officers, program officers, OSTABU, um, you know, our federal workforce compadres, we, we look at them as kind of objects and as, uh, you know, untouchables, but they are, they're humans as well. They are people just like us. Uh, they wake up and they put their pants on the same way. They have kids. They have families. They have things to worry about. Um, and they notice. Just as we notice when things, when people overstay their welcome, when someone uh, irks you the wrong way, they notice that. So don't overstay your welcome at their table or booth. Don't skip context clues and assume that they will remember who you are. As I said, if you've called them numerous times, if you have left voicemails, if you have emailed them and you have followed up and they have not responded, tell them that again. Say it, you know, in a kind way. Say, I, you know, I've reached out to you a few times. I know you're really busy about this subject, you know, can I email, can I follow up again on that email? And, and typically they will say yes, but they will now remember you. Now, will they respond? You know, we will see. But don't go in there, you know, accusing them because again, they are people too and they have, you know, just as many duties and as jobs as we do. And then don't just leave your card and expect them to reach out. Leave your card so they know who you are, but then you follow up. And something that um, I don't know if we put on this slide, but is don't follow up that evening and don't follow up with them the morning after because everyone else will be doing that when you follow up with them if the event's on a thursday i would wait until tuesday morning if the event was on a monday i would wait until maybe wednesday to send something or the next week just because you know that they are getting inundated with people trying to clamor and get their attention give it a few days and then make sure you follow up with them that way do with them once you find out who you're selling to see if they're hosting any industry days or small business sessions and go again this is part of doing the research do get involved in social events and awards functions to meet government officials they are everywhere and they love these things do follow up as i was mentioning after the event and say it was nice to meet them just don't do it the evening of or the day after because you'll get lost in the sea of emails Okay, next slide. All right, point number three, way three to warm up your cold calling approach is to start an online dialogue. And now this is one of the ones that I think is the most interesting shift that we've seen in recent years. Obviously, there are do's and don'ts of using the internet. We all know them, right? We've heard them. So it's the same when it comes to talking with your customers. Don't overstep your boundaries. Don't be creepy. Don't be inappropriate. I can't believe I have to say it, but it bears repeating. You know, if you're going to comment on a CEO's Twitter profile, make sure it's relevant to the content and not about the way that they look. Um, don't steal content and pass it off as your own. 
part of online dialoguing with other folks, whether it's people in your industry or just your customer, is we're all starved for content. We know that it's hard to create original content and people will pay other people to talk about SEO and how to stay relevant and how to stay top of mind. So just make sure when you're in those kind of efforts not to be taking content that your customers are putting out there without you know, attributing it to them. Don't shy away from your opinions online either. It's what makes you unique. There is a caveat there. Obviously, don't be, you know, so over the top that if you have some sort of, you know, outlandish viewpoints on something, nobody wants that. But there should be a flavor of who you are on social media if you're using it so that people can remember you so that warms up the cold call later. So be appropriately active on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Twitter and LinkedIn especially right now have been huge. The regulations, the, the rules for government employees using social media has changed. Before, they were not allowed to interact with you. They were not allowed to have profiles that were branded for the agencies. But now it's completely different. Now there are agency Twitter profiles that will put out a notice for a solicitation before it's on FBO. They'll put it out before it's really anywhere else. I mean, it's really outstanding. So be active and, and watch for opportunities there. Write relevant content where a customer can interact with you online. You know, that's the best way to connect with people online and to, and to meet friends there that can eventually become your customers is to be like-minded and to talk through, you know, relevant content together. And use the social media to observe, analyze, and understand what industry is sharing and to improve it. You know, people are going to talk about their needs, wants, and biases online, so pay attention to it. All right, next slide. Okay. So the fourth is about submitting RFIs and market research. And I'm sure if I could see everyone right now, they would be rolling their eyes and throwing their paper at Lisa and I. And we understand as proposal professionals that have worked in this industry for more than a decade, I can tell you I have submitted more RFIs and sources of thoughts than I would care to admit and probably have gotten about 10% of an outcome, um, an ROI that was worth it. But that being said, that 10% was completely worth it and helped establish relationships that I wouldn't have had and had opened and warmed up cold calls for me as, as I was direct selling to the government. So starting off with the don'ts. Don't name your electronic marketing documents. That's your RFIs, your market research, your white papers, your capability statements, anything that you send out to the government that's electronic. Do not market capability statement or an acronym of your company and just send it that way. Like, you know, like A, B, C, B, 1. Don't do that. And don't submit general white papers to multiple agencies. You want to make sure that everything that you submit is with intention. Do name your electronic marketing document so that it can be easily found. Because believe it or not, your beloved contracting officers, your Ostabu workforce people, they put them into files or a share drive on their own computer, and that's what they search. So you, would, you wouldn't believe how many times I have heard that, you know, they will just go in and type into the search bar in their file thing and search for cyber, and whatever pops up, that's what they will take. They will search for, you know, professional services. That's what they will do. So if your name isn't on it, if your niche isn't on it, if your set-aside isn't on the name of that actual saved document, go back and rename your documents now because that is how they search for you. Be purposeful in your submissions. As I mentioned, be intentional with what you're submitting. If you have white papers, if you have ideas about solutions to their problems, make sure you state that and that you are submitting those to the specific agencies. Don't just send around your marketing capability statement and RFI and then pull it to the white paper, just scan it out throughout the government because that's a good way to get ignored because it's not intentional and it's not focused with the purpose. The last thing, and we said this, I believe, you know, in the beginning of this presentation is follow up and be persistent. Take out those old RFIs and sources thoughts that you responded to last fiscal year and pull the points of contacts off of those and start calling. 
ask them, hey, you know, you know, give them a call and say, I respond to this source daughter RFI. Could you give me an update on where this has gone? And sometimes, and they'll respond to you and um, tell you, you know, it's been, you know, competed. That can show you a gap in your ability to track these things. Or they'll tell you, hey, nothing has happened on this yet. That's a good follow-up to say, oh, okay, is there still a need for this? Can we support you in this? Um, it's a great way to warm up that cold call. It's following up on those old RFIs and source of thoughts that you submitted that nothing responded to. Call them up and follow up on them, even the next fiscal year, because it's a great way to start that conversation. All right, next slide. All right, so the final way to warm up your cold calling approach is to make it easy. We all say we want to make it easy for our government customers, and yet rarely do we actually follow through on that. It's the same thing with proposals, right? We want to make it easy for them to evaluate. We want to make it easy for them to choose us. Let's actually make it easy for them when we use our cold calling as well. So as we've harped on countless times during this presentation, don't be inconsistent. You need to follow up when you say you will follow up. It should be in the voicemail. It should be in the email. Hey, I've reached out to you at this day and time. I will reach out to you again at this date and time and then do it. It's going to take a lot of um, really advanced scheduling for yourself, but you should put together a call plan if you are going to be using cold calling and stick to it. Don't force your customers to identify methods of acquisition when you call them. You should really have an idea on how to, you know, leverage the ways that you have for your customer to then put out solicitations again. So this is in the do column, right? You should do your research and identify how they can find you fast and leverage it. So your GSA schedules, it's perfectly acceptable to when you call say, hey, there's a need and here's why I think it should come out under this schedule. Here's why it would behoove you, here's why it makes sense. Not here's why I want it to be here because it's gonna benefit me. Here's how it's gonna benefit you, the customer. When you call people, don't have unrealistic spending expectations. If you've done your homework, like we mentioned before, and you see that somebody's you know, purchasing authority and what they've traditionally spent money on has been you know, under a $10,000 threshold, don't go to them with a $1 million solicitation idea. Um, and don't leave unidentifiable voicemails. It needs to be your name, the company that you represent, and the purpose of why you are calling. You know, and the company name really is one of the most important pieces that you can leave in that voicemail. I know it drives me nuts if some, like Bob calls me and he has something that he wants to say. And I'm like, okay, I don't know Bob. I don't know where Bob is. So give me a, a company that we can Google, that we can look up and say, okay, this is the person that called me. Um, have your past performance references available when you call. You need to say, hey, I've worked on these contracts and this is why it's relevant to you. And as mentioned before, do have your SAM.gov profile up to date. It's imperative, especially when you are reaching out and you are cold calling so that your government customer can look you up in this database and see if you guys are a good match. Amber, anything to add? I was going, yeah, absolutely. I was going to say, make sure all of these things are aligned. The one thing that Lisa and I work on with our clients um, when we start getting into helping them create their marketing and capability statements, their pipelines, helping them deep dive opportunities, is we always do kind of an intake where we look at your SAM profile, what FTDS has to say about you, um, if we can get into your CPARs, what your GSA schedule says about you, and then we go through your website and then your marketing document and your you know, SAM profile, if I didn't already say that. And we go through and what we find each and every time, and this is something that I'm sure we are also, um, you know, guilty of doing, is inconsistency, right? It's an inconsistency in how you market and how you kind of bundle your services together, the words you're using, the jargon you're using, the way that you refer to yourself, the acronyms you're using, and the way, you know, the, the lingo and the, the tone of how you present yourself make sure that's consistent because again we're all humans and they notice those things and so making sure your capability statements match up to what is on your website and making sure what's on your website matches up to your SAM and you keep walking down the list 
all of those things need to line up because the minute that they find an inconsistency or get confused, which is what I, you know, when I am looking for a vendor to do for something for my home or to, to, to do, you know, something like, you know, anything around the house. Um, and I see, you know, I look up a vendor and I start Googling. And if I find, you know, one thing that doesn't seem to line up to me or doesn't match, I, I click out, right? You know, I, I move on and find the next vendor only because I don't really have the time nor do I care to kind of figure that out. And you need to assume the same thing about your government purchasers and your buyers. So you need to make sure that you are consistent in what you're presenting. Well said. All right, next slide. Okay, that's all we have. Thank you guys very much. Thank you both for sharing your knowledge and insight today. Today's presentation has been recorded and can be found on our website or YouTube channel within about 48 hours. If you have questions about today's topic, please contact um, either Amber or Lisa at the email shown on your screen. Thank you, everybody. This concludes this webinar. Thank you.